The opening lines describe the great knowledge and wisdom of Gilgamesh, who saw everything, learned everything, understood everything, who probed to the bottom of the hidden mysteries of wisdom, and who knew the history of everything that happened before the deluge. He traveled far over sea and land, and performed mighty deeds, and then he cut upon a tablet of stone an account of all that he had done and suffered. He built the Wall of Eric, founded the Holy Temple of Iana, and carried out other great architectural works. He was a semi-divine being, for his body was formed from the flesh of the gods, and two-thirds of him were god, and one-third was man. The description of his person is lost. As shepherd or king of Erech, he forced the people to toil over much, and his demands reduced them to such a state of misery that they cried out to the gods and begged them to create some king who should control Gilgamesh and give them deliverance from him. The gods hearkened to the prayer of the men of Erech, and they commanded the goddess Aruru to create a rival to Gilgamesh. The goddess agreed to do their bidding, and having planned in her mind what manner of being she intended to make, she washed her hands, took a piece of clay and spat upon it, and made a male creature like the god Anu. His body was covered all over with hair. The hair of his head was long like that of a woman, and he wore clothing like that of Gira or Sumugan, the goddess of vegetation, i.e., he appeared to be clothed with leaves. He was different in every way from the people of the country, and his name was Enkidu, Eabani. He lived in the forests on the hills, ate herbs like the gazelle, drank with the wild cattle, and herded with the beasts of the field. He was mighty in stature, invincible in strength, and obtained complete mastery over all the creatures of the forests in which he lived. One day a certain hunter went out to snare game, and he dug pit traps and laid nets, and made his usual preparations for roping in his prey. But after doing this for three days, he found that his pits were filled up, and his nets smashed, and he saw Enkidu releasing the beasts that had been snared. The hunter was terrified at the sight of Enkidu, and went home hastily and told his father what he had seen, and how badly he had fared. By his father's advice, he went to Eric and reported to Gilgamesh what had happened. When Gilgamesh heard his story, he advised him to act upon a suggestion which the hunter's father had already made, namely, that he should hire a harlot and take her out to the forest so that Enkidu might be ensnared by the sight of her beauty and take up his abode with her. The hunter accepted this advice, and having found a harlot to help him in removing Enkidu from the forests, thus enabling him to gain a living, he set out from Eric with her, and in due course arrived at the forest where Enkidu lived, and sat down by the place where the beasts came to drink. On the second day when the beasts came to drink, and Enkidu was with them, the woman carried out the instructions which the hunter had given her. And when Enkidu saw her cast aside her veil, he left his beasts and came to her, and remained with her for six days and seven nights. At the end of this period, he returned to the beasts, with which he had lived on friendly terms. But as soon as the gazelle winded him, they took to flight, and the wild cattle disappeared into the woods. When Enkidu saw the beasts forsake him, his knees gave way, and he swooned from sheer shame. But when he came to himself, he returned to the harlot. She spoke to him flattering words, and asked him why he wandered with the wild beasts in the desert, and then told him she wished to take him back with her to Eric, where Anu and Ishtar lived, and where the mighty Gilgamesh reigned. Enkidu hearkened, and finally went back with her to the city, where she described the wisdom, power, and might of Gilgamesh, and took steps to make Enkidu known to him. But before Enkidu arrived, Gilgamesh had been warned of his existence 
and coming in two dreams which he related to his mother, Ninsuna, and when he and Enkidu learned to know each other subsequently, these two mighty heroes became great friends. The Second Tablet When Enkidu came to Erek, the habits of the people of the city were strange to him. But under the tuition of the harlot, he learned to eat bread, and to drink beer, and to wear clothes, and he anointed his body with unguents. He went out into the forest with his hunting implements, and snared the gazelle, and slew the panther, and obtained animals for sacrifice, and gained reputation as a mighty hunter, and as a good shepherd. In due course, he attracted the notice of Gilgamesh, who did not, however, like his uncouth appearance and ways. But after a time when the citizens of Eric praised him and admired his strong and vigorous stature, he made friends with him and rejoiced in him and planned an expedition with him. Before they set out, Gilgamesh wished to pay a visit to the goddess Ishkara, but Enkidu, fearing that the influence of the goddess would have a bad effect upon his friend, urged him to abandon the visit. This Gilgamesh refused to do, and when Enkidu declared that by force he would prevent him from going to the goddess, a violent quarrel broke out between the two heroes, and they appealed to arms. After a fierce fight, Enkidu conquered Gilgamesh, who apparently abandoned his visit to the goddess. The text of the second tablet is very much mutilated, and the authorities on the subject are not agreed as to the exact placing of the fragments. The previous details are derived from a tablet at Philadelphia. The Third Tablet The correct order of the fragments of this tablet has not yet been ascertained, but among the contents of the first part of its text, a lament by Enkidu that he was associated with the harlot seems to have had a place. Whether he had left the city of Erek and gone back to his native forest is not clear, but the god Shamash, having heard his cursing of the harlot, cried to him from heaven, saying, Why, O Enkidu, dost thou curse the temple woman? She gave thee food to eat, which was meant only for a god. She gave thee wine to drink, which was meant only for a king. She arrayed thee in splendid apparel, and made thee to possess as thy friend the noble Gilgamesh. And at present, Gilgamesh is thy bosom friend. He maketh thee to lie down on a large couch, and to sleep in a good, well-decked bed, and to occupy the chair of peace, the chair on the left-hand side. The princes of the earth kiss thy feet. He maketh the people of Eric to sign for thee, and many folk to cry out for thee, and to serve thee. And for thy sake he putteth on course attire, and arrayeth himself in the skin of the lion, and pursueth thee over the plain. When Enkidu heard these words, his anxious heart had peace. To the third tablet probably belongs the fragment in which Enkidu relates to Gilgamesh a horrifying dream which he had had. In his dream, it seemed to him that there were thunderings in heaven and quaking upon the earth, and a being with an awful visage, and nails like all eagles' talons gripped him and carried him off and forced him to go down into the dark abyss of the dread goddess Irkala. From this abode, he who once went in never came out, and he who traveled along that road never returned. He who dwelleth there is without light. The beings therein eat dust and feed upon mud. They are clad in feathers and have wings like birds. They see no light. They live in the darkness of night. Here Enkidu saw in his dream creatures who had been kings when they lived upon the earth, and shadowy beings offering roasted meat to Anu and Enlil, and cool drinks poured out from water skins. In this house of dust dwelt high priests, ministrants, the magician and the prophet, and the deities Atana, Sumakan, Ereshkigal, Queen of the Earth, and Belitseri who registered the deeds done upon the earth. When Gilgamesh heard this dream, he brought out a table, and setting on it honey and butter, placed it before Shamash.
The Fourth Tablet Gilgamesh then turned to Enkidu and invited him to go with him to the temple of Ninmak to see the servant of his mother, Ninsuna, in order to consult her as to the meaning of the dream. They went there, and Enkidu told his dream, and the wise woman offered up incense and asked Shamash why he had given to her son a heart which could never keep still. She next referred to the perilous expedition against the mighty king Kumbaba, which he had decided to undertake with Enkidu, and apparently hoped that the god would prevent her son from leaving Eric. But Gilgamesh was determined to march against Kumbaba, and he and Enkidu set out without delay for the mountains where grew the cedars. The Fifth Tablet In due course, the two heroes reached the forest of cedars, and they contemplated with awe their great height and their dense foliage. The cedars were under the special protection of Bel, who had appointed to be the keeper of Kumbaba, a being whose voice was like the roar of a storm, whose mouth was like that of the gods, and whose breath was like a gale of wind. When Enkidu saw how dense the forest was, and how threatening, he made to try Gilgamesh turn back, but all his entreaties were in vain. As they were going through the forest to attack Kumbaba, Enkidu dreamed two or three dreams, and when he related them to Gilgamesh, this hero interpreted them as auguries of their success and the slaughter of Kumbaba. The fragmentary character of the text here makes it very difficult to find out exactly what steps the two heroes took to overcome Kumbaba, but there is no doubt that they did overcome him, and that they returned to Eric in triumph. The Sixth Tablet On his return to Eric, Gilgamesh 1. Washed his armor, cleaned his weapons, 2. Dressed his hair and let it fall down on his back. 3. He cast off his dirty garments and put on clean ones. 4. He arrayed himself in the royal headcloth he bound on the fillet. 5. He put on his crown he bound on the fillet. 6. Then the eyes of the majesty of the goddess Ishtar lighted on the goodliness of Gilgamesh, and she said, 7. Go to Gilgamesh, thou shalt be my lover. 8. Give me thy love fruit, give to me, I say. 9. Thou shalt be my man, I will be thy woman. 10. I will make to be harnessed for thee a chariot of lapis lazuli and gold. 11. The wheels thereof shall be of gold, and the horns of precious stones. 12. Thou shalt harness daily to it mighty horses. 13. Come into our house with the perfume of the cedar upon thee. 14. When thou enterest into our house, 15. Those who sit upon thrones shall kiss thy feet. 16. Kings, lords, and nobles shall bow their backs before thee. 17. The gifts of the mountain and the land they shall bring as tribute to thee. 18. Thy, ellipses, and thy sheep shall bring forth twins. 19. Baggage animals shall come laden with tribute. 20. The horse in thy chariot shall prance proudly. 21. There shall be none like unto the beast that is under thy yoke. In answer to Ishtar's invitation, Gilgamesh makes a long speech in which he reviews the calamities and misfortune of those who have been unfortunate enough to become the lovers of the goddess. Her love is like a door that lets in wind and storm, a fortress that destroys the warriors inside it, an elephant that smashes his howda, and etc. He says, what lover didst thou love for long? Which of thy shepherds flourished? Come now, I will describe the calamity that goeth with thee. He refers to Tammuz, the lover of her youth, for whom year by year she arranges wailing commemorations. Every creature that falls under her sway suffers mutilation or death. The bird's wings are broken, the lion is destroyed, the horse is driven to death with whip and spur, and his speech concludes with the words, Dost thou love me, and wouldest thou treat me as thou didst them?
When Ishtar heard these words, she was filled with rage, and she went up to heaven and complained to Anu her father, and Antu her mother, that Gilgamesh had cursed her and revealed all her iniquitous deeds and actions. She followed up her complaint with a request that Anu should create a mighty bull of heaven to destroy Gilgamesh, and that she threatened her father that if he did not grant her request, she would do works of destruction, presumably in the world. Anu created the fire-breathing bull of heaven and sent him to the city of Eric, where he destroyed large numbers of the people. At length, Enkidu and Gilgamesh determined to go forth and slay the bull. When they came to the place where he was, Enkidu seized him by the tail, and Gilgamesh delivered deadly blows between his neck and his horns, and together they killed him. As soon as Ishtar heard of the death of the bull, she rushed out on the battlements of the walls of Eric and cursed Gilgamesh for destroying her bull. When Enkidu heard what Ishtar said, he went and tore off a portion of the bull's flesh from his right side and threw it at the goddess, saying, Could I but fight with thee, I would serve thee as I had served him. I would twine his entrails about thee. Then Ishtar gathered together all her temple women and harlots, and with them made lamentation over the portion of the bull which Enkidu had thrown at her. And Gilgamesh called together the artisans of Eric, who came and marveled at the size of the bull's horns, for their bulk was equal to three minas of lapis lazuli, and their thickness to the length of two fingers, and they could contain six cur measures of oil. Then Gilgamesh took them to the temple of the god Logalbanda, and hung them up there to the throne of his majesty. And having made his offering, he and Enkidu went to the Euphrates, and washed their hands, and walked back to the marketplace of Eric. And they went through the streets of the city, and the people thronged about them to get a sight of their faces. When Gilgamesh asked, Who is splendid among men? Who is glorious among heroes? These questions were answered by the women of the palace who cried, Gilgamesh is splendid among men. Gilgamesh is glorious among heroes. When Gilgamesh entered his palace, he ordered a great festival to be kept, and his guests were provided by him with beds to sleep on. On the night of the festival, Enkidu had a dream, and he rose up and related it to Gilgamesh. The Seventh Tablet about the contents of the seventh tablet, there is considerable doubt, and the authorities differ in their opinions about them. A large number of lines of text are wanting at the beginning of the tablet, but it is very probable that they contained a description of Enkidu's dream. This may have been followed by an interpretation of the dream, either by Gilgamesh or someone else. But whether this be so or not, it seems tolerably certain that the dream portended disaster for Enkidu. A fragment, which seems to belong to this tablet beyond doubt, describes the sickness and death of Enkidu. The cause of his sickness is unknown, and the fragment merely states that he took to his bed and lay there for ten days, when his illness took a turn for the worse, and on the twelfth day he died. He may have died of wounds received in some fight, but it is more probable that he succumbed to an attack of Mesopotamian fever. When Gilgamesh was told that his brave friend and companion in many fights was dead, he could not believe it, and he thought that he must be asleep. But when he found that death had really carried off Enkidu, he broke out into the lament which formed the beginning of the text of the next tablet. The Eighth Tablet in this lament, he calls Enkidu his brave friend and the panther of the desert, and refers to their hunts in the mountains, and to their slaughter of the bull of heaven, and to the overthrow of Kumbaba in the forest of cedar. And then he asks him, What kind of sleep is this which hath laid hold upon thee? Thou starest out blankly, and hearest me not. But Enkidu moved not, and when Gilgamesh touched his breast, his heart was still. Then laying a covering over him as carefully as if he had been his bride, he turned away from the dead body, 
and in his grief, roared like a raging lion and like a lioness robbed of her whelps. The Ninth Tablet In bitter grief, Gilgamesh wandered about the country uttering lamentations for his beloved companion in Kidu. As he went about, he thought to himself, I myself shall die, and shall I not then be as in Kidu? Sorrow hath entered my soul, because of the fear of death which hath got hold of me do I wander over the country. His fervent desire was to escape from death, and remembering that his ancestor Utanapishtim, the son of Ubara Tutu, had become deified and immortal, Gilgamesh determined to set out for the place where he lived in order to obtain from him the secret of immortality. Where Utanapishtim lived was unknown to Gilgamesh, but he seems to have made up his mind that he would have to face danger in reaching for the place. For he says, I will set out and travel quickly. I shall reach the defiles in the mountains by night, and if I see lions and am terrified at them, I shall lift up my head and appeal to the goddess Sin, and to Ishtar, the lady of the gods who is wont to hearken to my prayers. After Gilgamesh set out to go to the west, he was attacked either by men or animals, but he overcame them and went on until he arrived at Mount Mashu, where it would seem the sun was thought both to rise and to set. The approach to this mountain was guarded by scorpion men, whose aspect was so terrible that the mere sight of it was sufficient to kill the mortal who beheld them. Even the mountains collapsed under the glance of their eyes. When Gilgamesh saw the scorpion men, he was smitten with fear, and under the influence of his terror, the color of his face changed. But he plucked up courage and bowed to them humbly. Then, a scorpion man cried out to his wife, saying, The body of him that cometh to us is the flesh of the gods. And she replied, Two thirds of him is God, and the other third is man. The scorpion man then received Gilgamesh kindly and warned him that the way which he was about to travel was full of danger and difficulty. Gilgamesh told him that he was in search of his ancestor Utanapishtim, who had been deified and made immortal by the gods, and that it was his intention to go to him to learn the secret of immortality. The scorpion man in answer told him that it was impossible for him to continue his journey through the country, for no man had ever succeeded in passing through the dark region of that mountain, which required twelve double hours to traverse. Nothing dismayed, Gilgamesh set out on the road through the mountains, and the darkness increased in density every hour. But he struggled on, and at the end of the twelfth hour, he arrived at a region where there was a bright daylight, and he entered a lovely garden filled with trees loaded with luscious fruits, and he saw the Tree of the Gods. The Tenth Tablet In the region to which Gilgamesh had come stood the palace or fortress of the goddess Siduri Sabitu, and to this he directed his steps with the view of obtaining help to continue his journey. The goddess wore a girdle and sat upon a throne by the side of the sea, and when she saw him coming towards her palace, travel-stained and clad in the ragged skin of some animal, she thought that he might prove an undesirable visitor, and so ordered the door of her palace to remain closed against him. But Gilgamesh managed to obtain speech with her, and having asked her what ailed her, and why she had closed her door, he threatened to smash the bolt and break down the door. In answer, Siduri Sabitu told him, 33. Why are thy cheeks wasted? Thy face is bowed down. 34. Thine heart is sad. Thy form is dejected. 35. Why is there lamentation in thy heart? And she went on to tell him that he had the appearance of one who had traveled far, that he was a painful sight to look upon, that his face was burnt, and finally seems to have suggested that he was a runaway trying to escape from the country. To this, Gilgamesh replied, 39, Why should not my cheeks be wasted? My face bowed down, 40, my heart sad, my form dejected. 
And then he told the goddess that his ill looks and miserable appearance were due to the fact that death had carried off his dear friend Enkidu, the panther of the desert, who had traversed the mountains with him and had helped him to overcome Kumbaba in the cedar forest and to slay the bull of heaven. Enkidu, his dear friend, who had fought with lions and killed them, and who had been with him in all his difficulties. And he added, I wept over him for six days and nights before I would let him be buried. Continuing his narrative, Gilgamesh said to Sabitu Siduri, 57. I was horribly afraid. 58. I was afraid of death, and therefore I fled through the country. The fate of my friend lieth heavily upon me. 59. Therefore I am traveling on a long journey through the country. The fate of my friend lieth heavily upon me. 60. Therefore I am traveling on a long journey through the country. 61. How is it possible for me to keep silence about it? How is it possible for me to cry out the story of it? 62. My friend, whom I loved, hath become like the dust, and Kidu, my friend, whom I loved, hath become like the dust. 63. Shall not I myself also be obliged to lay me down? 64. And never again rise up to all eternity? 65. Gilgamesh continued to speak unto Subitu, saying, 66. O Subitu, which is the way to Utanapishtim? 67. What is the description thereof? Give me, give me the description thereof. 68. If it be possible, I cross the sea. 69. If it be possible, I will travel by land. 70. Then Sabitu answered and said unto Gilgamesh, 71. There is no passage most assuredly, O Gilgamesh. 72. And no one from the earliest times hath been able to cross the sea. 73. The hero Shamush, the sun god, hath indeed crossed the sea, but who besides him could do so? 74. The path is hard, and the way is difficult. 75. And the waters of death which block the other end of it are deep. 76. How then, Gilgamesh, wilt thou be able to cross the sea? 77. When thou arrivest at the waters of death, what wilt thou do? Sabitu then told Gilgamesh that ur Shanabi, the boatman of Utanapishtim, was in the place, and that he should see him, and added, 81. If it be possible, cross with him, and if it be impossible, come back. Gilgamesh left the goddess and succeeded in finding ur Shanabi, the boatman, who addressed to him words similar to those of Sabitu quoted previously. Gilgamesh answered him as he had answered Sabitu, and then asked him for news about the road to Utanapishtim. In reply, ur Shanabi told him to take his axe to go down into the forest and cut a number of poles sixty cubits long. Gilgamesh did so, and when he returned with them, he went up into the boat with ur Shanabi, and they made a voyage of one month and fifteen days. On the third day, they reached the limit of the waters of death, which ur Shanabi told Gilgamesh not to touch with his hand. Meanwhile, Utanapishtim had seen the boat coming, and, as something in its appearance seemed strange to him, he went down to the shore to see who the newcomers were. When he saw Gilgamesh, he asked him the same questions that Sabitu and ur Shanabi had asked him, and Gilgamesh answered as he had answered them, and then went on to tell him the reason for his coming. He said that he had determined to go visit Utanapishtim, the remote, and had therefore journeyed far, and that in the course of his travels he had passed over difficult mountains and crossed the sea. He had not succeeded in entering the house of Sabitu, for she had caused him to be driven from her door on account of his dirty, ragged, and travel-stained apparel. He had eaten birds and beasts of many kinds, the lion, the panther, the jackal, the antelope, 
mountain goat, and etc., and apparently had dressed himself in their skins. A break in the text makes it impossible to give the opening lines of Utanapishtim's reply, but he mentions the father and mother of Gilgamesh, and in the last twenty lines of the tenth tablet, he warns Gilgamesh that on earth there is nothing permanent, that Mamitum, the arranger of destinies, has settled the question of death and life of man with the Anunnaki, and that none may find out the day of his death or escape from death. The Eleventh Tablet The story of the deluge as told by Utanapishtim to Gilgamesh has already been given in the chapter titled so, and we therefore pass on to the remaining contents of this tablet. When Utanapishtim had finished the story of the deluge, he said to Gilgamesh, Now as touching thyself, which of the gods will gather thee to himself, so that thou mayest find the life which thou seekest? Come now, do not lay thyself down to sleep for six days and seven nights. But in spite of this admonition, as soon as Gilgamesh had sat down, drowsiness overpowered him, and he fell fast asleep. Utanapishtim, seeing that even the mighty hero Gilgamesh could not resist falling asleep, with some amusement drew the attention of his wife to the fact, but she felt sorry for the tired man, and suggested that he should take steps to help him to return to his home. In reply, Utanapishtim told her to bake bread for him, and she did so, and each day for six days she carried a loaf to the ship and laid it on the deck where Gilgamesh lay sleeping. On the seventh day, when she took the loaf, Utanapishtim touched Gilgamesh, and the hero woke up with a start, and admitted that he had been overcome with sleep and made incapable of movement thereby. Still vexed with the thought of death and filled with anxiety to escape from it, Gilgamesh asked his host what he should do and where he should go to effect his object. By Utanapishtim's advice, he made an agreement with ur the boatman, and prepared to recross the sea on his way home. But before he set out on his way, Utanapishtim told him the existence of a plant which grew at the bottom of the sea, and apparently led Gilgamesh to believe that the possession of it would confer upon him immortality. Thereupon, Gilgamesh tied heavy stones to his feet and let himself down into the sea through an opening in the floor of the boat. When he reached the bottom of the sea, he saw the plant and plucked it, and descended into the boat with it. Showing it to ur he told him that it was the most marvelous plant, and that it would enable a man to obtain his heart's desire. Its name was Shibu Isahir Amelu, i.e., the old man becometh young again, and Gilgamesh declared that he would eat it in order to recover his lost youth, and that he would take it home to his fortified city of Eric. Misfortune, however, dogged his steps, and the plant never reached Eric. For Willist Gilgamesh and ur were on their way back to Eric, they passed a pool the water of which was very cold, and Gilgamesh dived into it and took a bath. Willist, there was a serpent discovered the whereabouts of the plant through its smell and swallowed it. When Gilgamesh saw what had happened, he cursed aloud and sat down and wept, and the tears coursed down his cheeks as he lamented over the waste of his toil and the vain expenditure of his heart's blood and his failure to do any good for himself. Disheartened and weary, he struggled on his way with his friend, and at length they arrived at the fortified city of Eric. Then Gilgamesh told ur to jump on the wall and examine the bricks from the foundations of the battlements and see if the plans which he had made concerning them had been carried out during his absence. The Twelfth Tablet The text of the Twelfth Tablet is very fragmentary and contains large gaps, but it seems certain that Gilgamesh did not abandon his hope of finding the secret of immortality. He had failed to find it upon earth, and he had made arrangements with the view of trying to find it in the kingdom of the dead. The priests whom he consulted described to him the conditions under which he might hope to enter the underworld, but he was unable to fulfill the obligations which they laid upon him, and he could not go there. 
Gilgamesh then thought that if he could have a conversation with Enkidu, his dead friend, he might learn from him what he wanted to know. He appealed to Bel and asked him to raise up the spirit of Enkidu for him. But Bel made no answer. He then appealed to Sin, and this god also made no answer. He next appealed to Ea, who, taking pity on him, ordered the warrior god Nurgle to produce the spirit of Enkidu, and this god opened a hole in the ground through which the spirit of Enkidu passed up into this world like a breath of wind. Gilgamesh began to ask the spirit of Enkidu questions, but gained very little information or satisfaction. The last lines of the tablet seem to say that the spirit of the unburied man reposeth not in the earth, and that the spirit of the friendless man wandereth about the streets, eating the remains of food which are cast out from the cooking pots. <laughs>